the big Simon and Kirby success, of course, was Captain America. And when you have that on your resume, everything else looks a little pale by comparison. But Simon and Kirby were, became the guys who created new books. They were the, the people who could take uh, almost anything and turn it into something. They, they went to DC Comics after they did Captain America, and they did a strip called Boy Commandos, which was one of the highest selling comics of its day. They did the Newsboy Legion. They took an existing strip called Sandman and revamped it, and that became a hit. They took an existing strip uh, and turned it into a thing called Manhunter, and that was a huge hit. Uh, afterwards, they went off and they basically invented the love comic. Uh, they, they did a book called Young Romance, which sold millions of copies. They did a book called Black Magic. They did Bullseye. They did Fighting America. You just go on down this list. Uh, they just uh, could create a new book almost every week or so. When he first started Captain America and the other scripts he was working on in the 40s, he was really going for speed. You know, they just had to churn out a lot of work in a short amount of time. And so I think you don't see as much detail in that early work than, say, you you know, doing some of the later work for Marvel. But it's kind of when he developed a style where, you know, literally the guy's foot's jumping off the page. But the, they were working pretty fast, so there wasn't a lot of time for detail. Captain America was a very good selling book, but it wasn't Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. But he, even then, if you read uh, the old uh, uh, in issues of Walter Ego and things like that, the comments of the older artists in the 1940s saying they would look at Jack Kirby's work and they couldn't believe what he was doing then. So I think his work influenced so many people, even before the Marvel Age ever, ever was dreamed of, you know, 20 years before the Marvel Age was dreamed of. The time of Jack Kirby, it, 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 there's what you'd have to call the ages of Jack Kirby. There's the early age where, you know, he's with all the, all the uh, old guys who uh, began comics and, and people were just cranking out page after page after page. Then there was the terrible time, 1953, when uh, a guy named Frederick Wortham was, uh, came down on comic books uh, because he was a psychologist and he told America that comic books was cor were corrupting our children and the Congress attacked them just very, in a very similar way to the way uh, America attacked communists and, and comic books became no better than toilet paper. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's pretty horrifying to think that here are all these people who had, this, had these jobs and in in careers in an industry that suddenly before their eyes is disappearing They've just got to get out. Jack Kirby stayed in, but he stayed in around the edges. He would go, he and his uh, partner, Joe Simon, would go from company to company that survived, and they would create these little comic book companies. Then they would do three or four titles. They would appear, they would uh, hire all the peripheral guys who had been kicked out, bring them back in for a while, turn out three or four issues of three or four comic book titles for... Harvey comic books, for Archie comic books, and there was one other set of comic books where they did this group of comic books to try to bring back the, the, the more realistic comic books, and each time they failed. They tried other things. They wrote scripts for television. I think he, he had a show that NBC was interested in. He tried um, newspaper strips. He tried, to, you know, he was willing to try anything, but I think comics were the one thing that he could really, as an artist, focus on and, and just get what he wanted to say out there. I don't know if it happened right after that, soon after that, or immediately after that, or what, but Jack Kirby went back to his, own, his old stomping grounds, Timely Comics, and got together with Stan Lee and started to do comic books again. And that's the beginning of Marvel. And he went to work for them drawing these bizarre monster comics. He drew everything. He drew these bizarre monster comics. He drew romance comics. He drew westerns. He drew war for very, very bad money. All of these stories were done before. Not, maybe not everyone, not everyone exactly the same way, but essentially that was the theme of Stan's stories. Jack took those themes and turned those stories into feature-length movies or comic books and twisted these characters just enough to make them into heroes. Definitely without Jack Kirby there wouldn't be Marvel Comics. I mean because I think everyone agrees no matter how many different stories there are about what happened most people agree that they were shutting the doors before the FF came out. 
I mean, the way Jack tells it, the way he told it to me was he went up there and they were taking the chairs out. If you had said, can you go in and make a full range of superheroes out of what Timely had at that time, the answer would be no, that's not possible. But once they began, they could then step to the next one. So you had the Fantastic Four, then you had the Hulk, well, then you had Ant-Man, then you had Iron Man. Then, of course, there was Captain America who was frozen in the ice, or we didn't know where he was. Well, let's go get him. And then the Submariner. And then you can create new characters, and then let's go dig up some other characters, and let's do this and do that. And after a while, they have a comic book line, but the, and, and they have, in effect, the mirror of DC's comic book line. You know, and the funny thing is, I think I would have been proud to have said Jack and I did the Fantastic Four and let it go with that, but my gosh, at the same time, we were doing Thor and we were doing the X-Men, and we were doing Sergeant Fury and Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., and a lot of, and I don't even remember all the things. And Jack was equally good at every one of them. Every one of them. It's as though Jack Kirby's plan, which was to go in and see whatever is around and turn it into something, either stuff that's left over or make new stuff, it finally worked. He took what Stan was doing, and Stan... It's not like Stan was made to change. Stan was still doing his monster stories, except that these monsters turned into heroes. And it worked. Who would have predicted it? Yeah. I can't even imagine. Some people say that the initial plan was, okay, we'll revive Captain America and the Submariner and the Human Torch. Other people say J Stan had a vision. Other people say Jack had a vision. It's a little difficult to sort through all these things. But at some point, Stan and Jack put together the first issue of the Fantastic Four. And it had certain elements in it of the strip Jack had just done for DC called The Challenges of the Unknown. It had certain elements of the 40s timely comics. They brought back the Human Torch. But it had a lot in it that nobody had done in comics before. It was a very fresh, new kind of comic. And uh, it caught on. Somewhere along the line with the FF, Jack broke all the boundaries. You know, he just exploded. His imagination took off. What a vehicle the FF was for him, you know, and he created the FF, you know. And anybody who thinks otherwise doesn't understand Jack Kirby, because you think Stan Lee could have created the FF? No. Stan was the, was the instigator, and frankly, if Jack had written it, it would have been a bust. Stan was a terrific scripter. They were a great combination, Lennon and McCartney, you know. But Jack was the mind behind everything. Jack was the John Lennon. Paul was the guy who made it smooth. The two of them... Yeah, Stan sold the perfect. Business. Oh, yeah. He, the two were better than I've ever seen any, uh, any team before. Jack made the product, Stan sold the product. Yeah. He was the most imaginative, inventive guy I've ever met. I mean, he, his imagination was incredible. The things he thought of... If you know Jack's work, you can see all that stuff coming out of Jack's mind. Black Panther, perfect for him. Jack has always been an advanced thinker. You know, people talk about me as being one of the first people to put a black character, a black superhero in the comics. Well, Black Panther came first. Hello? <laughs> Let's not forget. Well, the thing that made Jack so special to me, A, he was so great to work with. He never missed a deadline. Whatever you needed. If I said to him, Jack, we're up, it, it's an emergency. I've got to have these five pages by tonight or tomorrow. I had them. He never did a job or a page that wasn't as good as his other pages. No matter how he had a rush, no matter what the conditions were, his quality was always up there. It never slacked off. I think that there, there may be people who have the talent to do what Kirby has done. So, let me, you know, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to idolize him so much. But, you know, it's Kirby and the world Kirby was in. Stanley said, Jack, do what you want. Jack said, well, you know, I'm going to do this. Fine. Yeah, I'm going to do this. Fine. Whatever you want to do, Jack, you do that. That was, that was Stanley's great gift. I remember uh, the first couple of issues of the FF I was a little bit lukewarm to because I, I didn't get it yet. And then well, came... Well, neither did they. It took them about yeah. four issues to figure out what they were doing. But there was a uh, splash page, I think it was in number seven. There was the splash page looking straight up.
at these buildings and the Fantastic Four were all being floated up, I think, by Dr. Doom. There's that great shot, in one of the panels of the Submariner climbing the building towards you. Yeah. That's another all space. And you go, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. You know, I'm a huge Superman fan. He's my favorite character, but every single Superman story began as Superman returns from uh, a mission in space, and then he gets involved with a story where Lois tries to figure out who he is. And I'm going, I want to see that space mission. Stan and Jack were the only ones who d ever did that yeah. space mission that I really desperately wanted to see. Jack worked on all the Marvel superhero books of the 60s to some extent. In some cases, it was advisory or suggesting villains or doing covers and sometimes designing the villains on the covers. But basically, he did this long run of Fantastic Four. He did uh, the early issues of the X-Men and the Avengers. He did the first couple of Thor stories, left the book, then came back and did an extended run on that. He did Captain America. He did the early Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. Uh, he did a bunch of issues of Iron Man. He did a, the first couple Hulk stories, then came back to that character. He drew whatever they told him to. It, it's interesting, you know, he did 102 issues of Fantastic Four. If he'd gotten the financial terms that he wanted and the contract he wanted, he would have stayed at Marvel forever, and he would have drawn Fantastic Four as long as they wanted. He could have done 200 issues or 300 issues. This dissatisfaction with the fact that Jack was so creative and so prolific and could carry a, a company on his back, and that uh, there came a time when he felt like, I should be getting more, I should be given some kind of position. Uh, I should be given a, a vice presidency. and I. Frankly, I can't blame him for that. That would have been something very nice. It just didn't seem to make sense to the company. Jack left Marvel early in 1970. He had a dispute which most politely could be characterized as saying that he felt he had not received either the uh, credit for the work he had done there or the money, some of the monies and rewards that had been promised him. You know, my father was, uh, he was a scrappy little guy and, um, you know, he didn't take well to getting pushed around, which I, which I think was one of the big frustrations uh, for him with Marvel, and that, you know, he didn't want to take things lying down, but on the other hand, you know, he had, uh, you know, a wife and four kids to feed. So he went over to DC Comics, and he started a series there called The New Gods. He did Jimmy Olsen. He started a lot of new books of varying quality and success. He wasn't happy about it, but he didn't feel he had a choice. He came by and said, you know, I'm, I'm going to D.C. And Mark and I said, wow, that was like, like something. And he said, would you like to come and be assistants to, to help me uh, do it? Because what he wanted to do was set up a West Coast operation. At that time, the, really the only West Coast comic book company was Western, which was doing the animation stuff. Anybody who wanted to work in comic books for DC or Marvel, you had to live on the East Coast. Jack was the first guy they, I think, they ever let out, so he, he could mail his stuff in. Because this was before, in the old days, before the internet, before faxes, before FedEx. Everything was the post office or the phone. And for a couple of years, Steve and I assisted him by virtue of doing darn near nothing. Uh, Jack n did not need assistance. If some of his plans had materialized, he, he would have, but if he was just going to sit there and write and draw new gods, we were just there kind of to keep him company. And uh, my main function was to say, hey, that sounds like a good idea, Jack. <laughs> he would show us what he had come up with and ask us what we thought. And he also wanted us to, to write and do things because he had the idea, as soon as he went to D.C., to do the two uh, magazines in the Days of the Mob and Spirit World. So we were going to help write stuff for that. And to come up with any ideas we had, because he was doing four books. He was doing Jimmy Olsen, New Gods, Forever People, Mr. Miracle. 